It's the first time in my career where source code escrow actually worked. It's like you're doing open heart surgery and you've never, you've never even done it before. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's a little scary. They now can work with data at any scale across their organizations. First time that's true. It was never true before. I mean, I mean as we enter a period of concern about recession, uh, where cost control becomes more and more of a, a highlight of what people are focused on. All right, Bob, uh, it's a pleasure and an honor to again reconnect with you and follow up on this one hour session for our Above the Clouds podcast session. How have you been? Good. It's great to have a chance to chat with you, Ming Ching. Yeah, thank you, Bob. So to start with, uh, I guess you don't really need an intro. People know you were a longtime veteran at Microsoft, uh, overseeing SQL Server and other products, and then transitioned to Snowflake uh, as an early stage uh, CEO for the early stage company. Curious to learn about your journey there a bit, and especially if you have a war story or two to share that may not have been well known uh, by the audience so far. Well, there's a lot of war stories over the years. I mean, I can go back, you know, certainly to the early days at Microsoft um, in, in some of the early things we were working on to help bring data into, into PCs and, and onto people's desktops. I mean, I started out, my first role at Microsoft was uh, running, running the program management of SQL Server, basically getting the product out the door, the first version of it, which was on OS2 um, at the time. Um, but then after that, I actually went into run OS2 program management for a bit and then transitioned to a project called Cairo, which was really about information management in the very early, early part of the 1990s. And Bill had, had done a talk um, at Comdex in 1990 called Information at Your Fingertips. And so I was involved in Cairo was trying to build a, a file system, an object file system to, to essentially allow you to index everything on your desktop and everything in your network. And, it, it was overly blown and it, it didn't quite work out the way we thought it would, but we learned a lot in the process of, of things. So that was an early, early war story there. I mean, did many in Snowflake, I mean, in Snowflake's, uh, you know, past, I mean, one of the sort of the classic ones was uh, just the challenges we had, you know, underneath Snowflake is, is a, a data store called Foundation DB and it's the transaction store of, of Snowflake. And just in some of the early days, wrangling that thing, making that thing work and then there was a period where the company that had had um, uh, built the product, which is a proprietary product um, that we were using, was a sister company of ours. It was con connected to our, our, our venture capitalist partner, Sutter, Sutter Hill. Um, but we we that that product actually was purchased by Apple and disappeared from the market. And um, and it was the heart of Snowflake, and still is the heart of Snowflake. And 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 we survived because we had a source code escrow and were able to rebuild the product and, and kind of, and because we're a bunch of database people kind of work without any support, but actually make the thing work in the early days. And now fortunately that technology is open source and they're on a very strong base with it and things. So things have come a long way there, but it was pretty rough um, in some of those early days. Oh, wow. Sounds like an interesting journey. You mentioned Bob. So I've heard a bit about uh, the stories behind uh, using foundation DB. Um, they don't know that, uh, Earlier, it wasn't open source, and you had to kind of, uh, you know, uh, make some magic happen, uh, getting yeah. it to work. It's the first time in my career where source code escrow actually worked. It actually worked through Iron Mountain, and and we were able to get the product. We were running it, but then we got the source code, and we, you know, we, when you make your first change to something that's that is literally your heart, and and it's like you're doing open heart surgery, and you never you've never even done it before. Um, mm -hmm. It's it's a little scary. I can imagine. Along that journey, I'm curious, have folks ever considered whether to open source Snowflake itself back then? You know, there really isn't. I think that that uh, because we were always building a service, it never was a requirement. And because we are SQL compatible, um, Snowflake is SQL compatible, it wasn't like there was a huge learning curve for Snowflake. Um, if people were familiar with with pretty much any SQL database, Redshift, Postgres, pretty much anything, you kind of know Snowflake. So there wasn't the same motivation from a, from a, a perspective of, of gaining uh, um, 
usage and, and gaining 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 training on the product and and because it's a service it's very easy to deliver and it was pretty cost effective so it wasn't too much of a problem indeed indeed uh the conventional wisdom is that uh using open source can be a good way to kind of improve the market adoption, right? To improve kind of the top of funnel with MySQL Postgres and more recently with, let's say, Kafka, uh, Trino slash sure. Uh, sure. You know, other products. But, you know, what I see is Snowflake has been uh, doing a really great job of promoting the free tier service, kind of freemium model. And that's also another great way of improving the market adoption. Um, versus, I guess, you know, starting with open source way sometimes improves the friction a bit. People have to build it and deploy it in the right way. Well, and the really thing is, is that people don't really want, I mean, most people don't want to, to deploy open source today mm -hmm. and okay. run that environment today. They'd much rather acquire the technology from a cloud service. And that's sort of one of the fundamentals of the modern data stack is that, is that it is delivered as a cloud service and you don't run the infrastructure yourself. So in that sense, open source doesn't help you in, 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 in that regard, but it does provide some comfort to some customers in, in certain circumstances. It just wasn't, you know, in a services world, it's not necessarily required. And I think Snowflake is, is demonstrable of that. Yes, yes. So indeed, the cloud deployment, a large part of it is about ease of uh, deployment, kind of outsourcing the prior work that have to be done in-house. Uh, in and along that spirit, uh, pay as you go, the consumption-based pricing model, I heard that that was really kind of you uh, went to Snowflake and kind of solidified that pricing model. I wonder if you can share with us the journey and the key learnings there in getting that pricing model right. Well, I don't think it was ever a question that Snowflake would be a usage-based pricing model. Mm -hmm. The question was, how would we structure it, per se? Mm -hmm. um, and, and you know, we, we were already in a world where Amazon was out there. Redshift had mm -hmm. its sort of pricing model, you know, and, and Amazon does had a more physical sort of structure that they they offered where you're deploying nodes and you know you can discount them if you purchase them for long you know long periods of time ris and things and and the thing about snowflake that was very different is the dynamic nature of it the fact that you could spin up a warehouse at any moment in time and you could you could change its size dynamically and you could spin it down at any point in time you had multiple running I mean, and, and although this wasn't a consideration early on, we knew over time we would have multiple regions that would be running in around the world. And so you also have the ability to consume resources in different locations. And so, you know, we wanted something very dynamic. And, and when I got to Snowflake, um, we had sort of written the first two contracts for our first two customers were, were, sort, of, were sort of templated. And it was a fairly traditional structure of, of you know selling nodes kind of and for but it was kind of weird it was nodes for a certain number of hours a day it was a little bit they were a little funky it was a little funky and and you know what i wanted which what i thought was important was that snowflake was a service and it was providing a lot of value to customers it wasn't about physical nodes and things like that and so i wanted the pricing model to be more abstract and much more dynamic and flexible for customers and so we needed an abstraction unit and we needed something to, to abstract. And really that's what the credit is there for. The credit is, is primarily something that's an abstraction of compute resources. I mean, it's roughly, it is effectively equivalent to a node hour, but it's, it, but it's much more flexible than a node hour in terms of the way you can use it and chop it into pieces and use it in different, and you know, they can now break it into the second and in, in, in serverless services and charge for that. So it's very, very flexible. And, and that's, you know, that's where that really came from is the realization that you needed something to discount that was an abstraction. And I learned, you know, I was fortunate that, that I had been involved in, in pretty much all of the enterprise pricing discussions that Microsoft had had for server products, you know, in, in the time I was there. So I had a lot of experience with pricing and, and then it was, and, and it was taught by the best between Steve Ballmer and Chris Capicella, who is still at Microsoft running marketing. I was taught by the masters. So. Oh, that, that, that's great. So um, you talked about the challenges along kind of searching for kind of uh, fine tuning the pricing model. Beyond that, can you share a war story as you kind of, you just landed uh, at Snowflake as the CEO at that time? What was the status there in terms of kind of reaching the product market fit? And what was an example challenge that uh, the company uh, had to overcome uh, under your leadership? 
Well, I mean, the, the, you know, we were, when I was there, when I joined, I was employee number 33. Um, uh, it was mostly engineers. We had a small sales team. Chris Degnan was there, who's you know, still, Chris continues to still run sales at, at Snowflake. And there were a few sales, there was a couple of really BDRs there. Um, they later become became full salespeople, but they were their BDRs at the time in, in 2014. And um, uh, the, we were running, we were running towards what the, you know, the founders had sort of set was some form of general availability roughly at the end of that year, which I kind of instantly knew was, was overly optimistic. I haven't been through this enough times. And, and I watched, um, we were doing at the time, these two month milestones and I watched the first couple of them. And basically I noticed that, that everything they said they were going to do, they actually didn't finish during the milestone. Um, a lot of things they did do, they did do a lot of work. They did a lot of things, but they actually didn't kind of do what they said they were going to do. And there was no real clear plan as to how, um, how we would get to general availability or even what it meant. And so I, you know, I just sort of stepped in and, and, and started and started essentially engineering manage it, the process and turned, I mean, I don't know what I recommend this, but I turned our team meeting, our uh, weekly team meeting we had on Monday into an engineering review, basically, where we would, because everybody, the, the only thing the salespeople cared about was the status of the product and, 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 and how it was working. Um, they didn't care about anything else. And so we may as well talk about that. And so that's what we did. And, and, you know, we drove, essentially we set the goals of what we needed to ship, you know, all of the different functions that were required for general availability. And to me, it was the things you needed to be an enterprise class data warehouse. So, you know, a backup strategy, which was, you know, the foundation of, of where um, you know, time travel, it was, a, it was a big part of that, but um, also fail safe came from, from that conversation. Uh, uh, the ability clearly to be able to upgrade the ser the service with in a non disruptive way, um, and and get in a rigor, you know we had gotten at that point in 2015 we'd gotten into a, the rigor that I think Snowflake still follows, which is a weekly a weekly update, um, and and so we were learning how to do that and learning how to do it in a way that didn't disrupt customers because prior to that we were taking customers down whenever we did an upgrade. Um, and so we were, you know, we learned how to, how to run the service basically, um, and to, and, and finish the security features. We finished all the encryption stuff. Um, we finished the, the role-based authorization. I mean, all of those core features that you need to be an enterprise class product. Um, it was still awful early, to be honest with you. I'm not sure we were really enterprise class when we shipped, but we had the core features we needed. Yeah, that sounds like a, such a humongous effort to build out the series of features to be enterprise ready, learning how to run a service. Maybe my last question in the segment of how to be a good early stage CEO before we maybe transition to cost efficiency. Uh, my question is, what would be your advice for other early stage CEOs in terms of managing such a large effort, trying to carve out the milestone so there's some incremental delivery points, maybe even closing some customer sales versus keeping the eye on the ball, building out for the long run. How do you balance these short-term, long-term concerns? Well, what I always say to everyone is always, you know, the, ultimately you're building a product that somebody wants to buy. And so, you know, it's really always starts with the product. And, and you know, I spend most of my time focusing on the product and then the process that you use to create it and how the teams are formed and the people and things like that. Um, but, you know, my key thing is, is really understanding is ensuring that, you know, the, the, the management team, the leader of the organization and, and the key, the key leaders within the organization really are aligned in understanding what the customer problem you're trying to solve is. You have real clarity on that. A lot of times early stage companies don't have that clarity, um, get clarity on the exact problem you're trying to solve and then how you solve it in a way that is differentiated and, and, and can create a go to market. I mean, the other thing that, that, that I'm constantly seeing now, this is a new sort of phenomena, which is that because of the evolution of the modern data stack, you know, from vendors like Snowflake and Databricks and Google and others, um, uh, there's an ecosystem out there uh, that's pre-existing ecosystem. And so one of the key things is how do you insert into that ecosystem in some way where you add value to the customer 
and and complement the other uh, other parts of the ecosystem. So those are all good considerations to take into account. Are there any challenges regarding there? Are, there's just simply too much to build, so there needs to be some intermediate checkpoint that uh, could be monetized or could be measured. Well, like I say, you got to figure out what the problem you're trying to solve is and I focus see. on on you know the short term problem where the customer has the most pain mm -hmm. that you can solve effectively in a reasonable yeah. time frame and go after that problem yeah. and then expand and build from it. So you have to start with the foundation of something. Though. Yeah. I mean, the case of Snowflake, what we started with was really, mm -hmm. I mean, the product was a well understood product, right? A data warehouse is nothing new. Cloud data warehouse is a bit new. Yeah. Um, Redshift had been pre existing, um, certainly providing it completely as a service the way Snowflake did, that was definitely new. Yeah. Um, but the, you know, the initial customers that, that, you know, we, we went after and, 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 and were successful in, 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 make, in getting on Snowflake were customers that had a problem with semi structured data. Um, because at the time, you know, the only thing you could really use alternatively to Snowflake was Hadoop, which was miserable for everybody. And so um, uh, uh, Snowflake was a good alternative for those customers that were struggling with Hadoop. And then we had we did a lot of Redshift conversions when customers found that Redshift wasn't scaling to meet their needs. And so we had some pretty straightforward early stage, uh, early adopter uh, profiles. And the other thing that was key to who we, we had to go after back five years ago was that cloud was very nascent. And so you had to have data customers that had a lot of data on the cloud um, and yet weren't that security conscious because we weren't really ready at that time to handle some of the more high levels of enterprise security. Now that's changed subsequently, but at the time it was an issue. Right, right. So that was the early days of kind of bootstrapping that cloud uh, databases, the modern, the foundation of the modern data stack. And over the uh, over the subsequent years, there must be various challenges that were brought up and over uh, overcome. Uh, there was security related discussion, how people are now more ensured that cloud based database may be even more secure than the on prem or in general, the cloud system compared to, to uh, the on prem system. Um, I'm curious about the cost efficiency angle, Bob. Uh, early on, I think you know, when, when a company was early at the journey of moving from on prem to cloud, the calculation probably would be relatively easy. Initially, for on, uh, for on, uh, cloud uh, workloads, they swipe a credit card. They miss they may spend start by spending hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars a month. So at that time, uh, people would be probably presumably very happy to convert the capex to opex uh, investment. Um, I'm curious early on, were there discussion or some ROI projection regarding kind of the on-prem? Uh, the ownership, uh, the cost over the years versus if people start transitioning to the cloud, what the ROI would look like? Well, you know, I think in, in almost all cases, we could mm -hmm. provide a very strong ROI to customers mm -hmm. for conversion to the cloud because our yeah. services basically were more cost effective than what they were running. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was almost always true. I mean, Redshift being perhaps the one true exception to that where Redshift is so cheap to begin with, it's hard to it's hard to be cheaper than we never tried to be cheaper than Redshift. There was never a goal to be cheaper than Redshift, and as it only isn't, it, it's but it's not that much more expensive. But it's it's not it's definitely not designed to be cheaper. Um, but compared to on-premises software, you know whether it's Netiza or Teradata or Oracle or even SQL Server, um, you know Snowflake Snowflake could provide a pretty good a pretty good value. The challenge the customers have with cost is that what Snowflake does. And this was totally by design, by the way. I mean, this is completely in the plan. Is it removes all the limitations of those other software, so you can use, you know, you can eat a lot more. It's like, you know, it's like a person who's been on a diet for their whole life. You know, now all of a sudden they they have this whole smorgasbord in front of them. They can eat anything they want, um, and and that's where the cost issues come in. Is is that people do a lot of things with with cloud with cloud services they never could do before in the on-premises world and there's costs associated with what you do indeed um and then that brings up the discussion regarding whether the ecosystem the product itself including the best practices whether there should be more god wheels for people to ac avoid accidentally consuming too much there was uh, something about uh, with infinite cloud compute power 
potentially comes with infinite uh, cloud bill size. <laughs> uh, in your view, uh, Bob, you know, how has that space been evolving? You know, there's been kind of in the public cloud space, there are more and more companies on cost visibility and optimization, uh, even a bit more crowded with now more acquisition consolidation. But it seems like the cost visibility and optimization for data cloud uh, is relatively new uh, emerging area. Where do you see this would be heading to? You know, the vendors themselves, like Snowflake, Databricks, will probably be doing more work in that area themselves. There are also more vendors coming up in that space. But then, uh, you know, to your point, kind of the insertion point, integration with the rest of the modern data stack is super critical. So I'm curious about your view, like uh, at this stage of the maturity of the modern data stack, uh, how would so how big of a problem have you seen uh, users experience and what are some of the good ways of tackling the space of providing the visibility and optimization for the cloud uh, data workloads and uh, and cost well i mean in this i think this is a case where it's a combination of the vendors like snowflake or databricks together with other vendors in the ecosystem such as blue sky i mean and and and, and potentially customers as well depending on what they may want to do there's some things that only the vendor can do, um, like put on quotas, for example. Um, that's something that you kind of have to do inside the system uh, if you're going to do an enforcement of quota, especially, and, and do it in, 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 in real time. And, and so that was necessary for, 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 for you know, a company like Snowflake to implement it, which is why we did that relatively early um, in, our, in our cycle. Um, the other thing is providing visibility into, into usage information and and making sure that 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 the customer and any tools they may be using has a plethora of information and data available to actually work with to understand how the costs are being or where the costs are going so that they can be properly allocated um i think that we're largely in the state now i think you could tell me I mean, that 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 the vendor like snowflake has those foundational pieces in place at least snowflake does i, I can't speak for Databricks or all the others necessarily, but but we think I mean I, we, we with, with data sharing I know we we provided a huge amount of data about about usage and it, it took a while we were a little late in doing it because it, because we wanted data sharing we wanted to do it through data sharing and we took a few years to implement data sharing but it was one of the first things that we did once we we had that um, but I think there's a tremendous opportunity for the industry to continue to innovate in this space. Um, and and there's tools and services that people will want. Um, you, you know, but cost allocation between departments, controls, you know, more detailed information about usage. I think there's a lot of opportunity for the ecosystem to, to evolve. Indeed, some of the elements you mentioned, cost allocation, chargeback between departments, control the budget and the prediction of the growth and so on. Um, my understanding there is there's been such a set of so-called financial operations, FinOps best practices that have been increasingly established in the public cloud space. And maybe there's you know a kind of uh, a set of techniques we can borrow, extend to apply to the data cloud area. I wonder from your past journey, uh, whether you have interacted with the financial ops uh, side of the things with organizations that are setting up kind of cross-functional across uh, having technologists, engineers, as well as uh, maybe finance, no, uh, my financially minded people to together achieve cost efficiency for cloud-based systems. Oh yeah, I mean, absolutely. When I was at Snowflake, I mean, I did have these meetings with with financial financial ops people that that had cost concerns. Certainly, they they when they would they had real cost concerns, they come to the CEO, right? So, so I've had that. I've had that. Usually, those sorts of issues you're able to resolve with the customer, and working through you know whatever their their specific issues are, and 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 to and to help and to help them. But the thing I would say is is that the solution to the cost issues associated with tools like data tools like Snowflake is actually the solution to, to the cost issues associated with with it in general which is data and and snowflake or whatever data system you're using to be able to actually operate with data and so the real key to helping financial operations operate you know, effectively is to have access to all of the data on a near real-time basis so they can make appropriate appropriate decisions and make sure that their organizations are are utilizing their budgets appropriately and things. I mean, it's 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 certainly more true right now. I mean, as we enter a period of concern about recession, 
uh, where cost control becomes more and more of a, a highlight of what people are focused on. Indeed, uh, that resonates with uh, also the customer voice we have heard uh, in this economy market cost efficiency, cost control becomes, a, beco uh, becomes an even higher priority. Recently, there's a, a gathering of CIOs where we pitched Blue Sky among uh, other founders. And uh, I got a chance to ask various CIOs, how they define cost efficiency for data cloud or maybe for cloud systems in general. I would say I haven't got a truly satisfying answer in the sense that some of them uh, told me let's say if they invest in a new project, let's say a new set of data pipelines, and that increases the company revenue by 10 million. But uh, the cost of running these pipelines is uh, much below that, then they consider that success. But uh, I'm curious if they, you know, any of them have done work like, should this set of pipelines uh, been costing a million dollars? Could it have been done with half a million? What about the human side of cost? Can it be managed by half of a, a, an engineer versus a team of five you know, data engineers? They don't seem to have satisfying answers yet. I'm curious of uh, what your view is, Bob, and especially given your experiences with the pre previous on-prem era, where probably people would have done similar calculation with the computer side of the cost, software license included, as, as well as the human resource side of the cost. How do they compare uh, now with the the cloud era. You, you mentioned earlier that the ROI is higher. Um, I'm curious uh, if you have some an anecdotal stories or some kind of high level numbers to share comparing the on-prem uh, with the cloud uh, based kind of data processing. Well, it's, it's always a squishy comparison, right? Because, mm. because in a service world, the costs are very well defined. Mm. I mean, you, 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 you know what they are. They may be variable, by month if they're usage based but you know what they are and in the case of usage based commitments I mean most companies now make you know almost every I mean, all snowflake customers have a, have a single year commitment or a multi year commitment one or the other so there's a long term commitment so there's a, 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 a there's a rough expectation of what the organization is going to spend associated with that in non premises world um, the costs are 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 diffused and are, are not necessarily apparent because you've got a lot of people costs, you've got building and power costs, you know, you have maintenance costs. There's a whole set of things that, that, that have to be taken into account in terms of running an organization like that. And of course you can sum all those up into a budget. My point is, is that in some senses, there's a lot of clear, you know, in the service world, there's real clear line items and you can see where your costs are going. And you can make you can make judgments, value judgments about whether those those services are providing you the value that that that, that justifies the costs. You know, it's the case where you have the big line items, right? You know, whether it's a database, a data service like Snowflake, or or a cloud service like AWS or Azure. You know, that's where you you really need to get in and refine how you can how how you can uh, get the maximum benefit for the least cost from it. Um, which is, you know, again, that's where the industry can continue to innovate. Right. Uh, when there's a, a big ticket item, let's say there's a, a, a general, let's say, snowflake bill, then uh, people would want to gain more visibility into it, break it down into, as we mentioned earlier, the per department cost and so on. Um, some of the users are concerned if they need to, if they want to break it down, they need to do a lot of so called tagging. You know, tag the jobs to attribute properly uh, the cost of individual projects. Or they just use coarser grained instruments, let's say assign different departments, different warehouses. Yeah, I mean, the users, you, yeah, I mean, there's ways to do it there, just, just coarser grained. It can be very, obviously, it can be very detailed. If you want to get to a project level, you could, you could detail mm -hmm. tag things. Right, right. Yeah, so I guess that's currently perceived as a trade off between doing a bunch of upfront tagging work. Uh, versus just using coarser grain instrument, but- uh, well, I mean, this is also an area where I would argue that perhaps mm -hmm. perhaps tools could could provide yeah. more information because I mm -hmm. think you could probably discern, like I, mm -hmm. I don't understand why the user has to do tagging. It seems mm -hmm. like it seems like ML algorithms could probably do a pretty good job of tagging those those jobs jobs too. So there's things you could probably do, you know, you could probably do it in, in, in products that, that the ecosystem provides to make it easier for users, but- mm -hmm. 
Uh, that's great. That was actually my next question, like where the ML AI technology could come in to help uh, tackle areas, uh, you know, problems in this area. So tagging indeed is one of them. Okay, anything associated, anytime you're trying to understand trends or, or, mm -hmm. or understand behavior of things, you can, you can leverage any, especially when there's a lot of information that becomes difficult for people to sort through. People have limitations as to how much they, how much data they can work with and then they need to have. They need to have systems help them with that. Yeah, and a follow-up question there, Bob, is you know, uh, you have seen decades of the database evolution from SQL Server and whatnot. Uh, with Oracle Stellar Data, there was a large army of DBAs. Somehow, my impression with the modern you know cloud databases, there's less of a notion of DBAs. There are data infra engineers, professional service solution architects, you know, Snowflake Databricks experts. But do you see this kind of talent pool of the performance experts somehow decreasing? Is it justified because cloud database is indeed more self-tuned? We don't need so many tuning experts. Or, or where do you see as the need for the tuning? And then where well, does AI software come in? As a I think that, that, that the idea of like tweaking where you place index files on hard disks which is what you used to do in in the old days of you know running on premises things where how did you distribute the database across the disks and where do you place the indices those skills will be will be concentrated in companies like snowflake and microsoft and amazon and things like that because they're the ones that worry about those sorts of problems data modeling on the other hand is a real you know is an, is has become more important than ever i would argue much more important than ever you know, which is why we've seen the shift um, uh, to more modern pipeline tools like Fivetran, which copy the entire schema over and create an operational schema in the data warehouse, copy all the data over, and then use tools like DBT to do data transforms against that um, to to form the data the data the the data model that people want to use. You know, as we go forward, I think modeling will continue to become more and more interesting and business modeling will become sort of the next major frontier. Um, but but that's where I think all these things go is towards towards understanding concrete concepts around and, and codifying concrete concepts around the business into the database in the form of a knowledge graph. Um, uh, and that's where I think all of the data engineers and all those things start to move towards over the next five years, um, but they certainly move away from the placement and all that 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 brouhaha that you used to have to do in the olden days. Yeah. So when you and I connected last time, we had an interesting chat about knowledge graph and relational AI. I would love to touch on that. But just before that, um, one question on this subject. Um, you know, data modeling used to be, uh, it seems like a a well understood practice with uh, star schema, snowflake schema, and so on. And uh, in the old on prem uh, world, it seems there used to be a DBA or database architect that's, that's the initial modeling. These days, with data clouds and with the advent of modern tools, modern data stack, people were writing new data pipelines in the distributed way, hiring a team of analytical engineers, let's say. It seems to me like the easier part is to your point. Data clouds really lift the curtain, lift the restrictions. So you can have a large team of people who all independently add their data pipelines. The limitation is gone. But as a result, the data modeling quality may not be as under control as well, because there's no central person that kind of serve as the gatekeeper that want to keep the data model simpler. What's your take on that, Bob? And do you think the AI ML technology or some other newer technology might come in to potentially address the data modeling challenges. Well, I do think we'll see we'll see um, ML technology applied to data modeling and business modeling. I think it's one of the areas where it's required to solve the problem. Um, the number of different data data attributes and data sources that large organizations have are frankly beyond what people can can model and, and think through themselves. Um, the uh, the it's, there's more to the problem than that. I mean, I think that this is where the, the structure of how you organize teams comes into play. Um, this is where the you know the so-called data mesh architecture gets interesting in the sense of 
And to me, what data mesh is really all about is, is an organizational concept of how you organize and think of data as a product and offer it and, and have organizations that own the source of data as a product and they have that ownership. So you, what you do to some extent is you break this problem up into different domains um, so that people can have uh, uh, ownership associated with it. That said, I think it's still augmented with tools that will be, will be ML powered. Um, but I think those concepts are, 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 they interplay well. Now, obviously a smaller organization doesn't have, isn't big enough to break things up into domains and things. But if you have a problem, we're building a big team of people and you've got a lot of, because you've got so many different data sources, et cetera, that sort of domain oriented concept is the right way to do things. What would be an example, Bob, an example organization that uh, provides exemplary, I guess, practices in, I guess, the data mesh concept, being able to package data into, into products? I mean, it's a great question to ask the Snowflake. Someone's actively at Snowflake right now because they probably they probably would tell you the best yeah. customers that they have, the customers that they have that are that are doing this the most. You know what I will say is that is mm -hmm. that the tools that Snowflake provides, the data sharing tools, and the uh, data exchange tools that are designed to allow organizations to share data within across different teams. Um, those are precisely these tools to allow that sort of thing. I actually think it's common. I think it's now becoming common that large organizations are getting structured this way. And so once we are able to break up the data practice into these kind of decentralized, uh, self, more self-independent data products, I guess that's where people can truly leverage the power of the data cloud even more scale independently. But right, you can scale now. You can scale essentially to whatever size you you want because the yeah. system can scale. I mean, the the mm -hmm. Snowflake can scale. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the question is, is, does the people, does the organization scale, and how do you scale the organization in working with data around it? Mm -hmm. And you know, these aren't. There's no. This isn't a magic bullet that solves all problems, but it is a structural. It's a technique that I think is 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 correct. I mean, it's the direction you want to go to. You should think of data as a product. Everyone should think of data as a product. And if, if it's too complicated for one team to think of it as a product, you probably need multiple teams. Makes sense, yeah. So we talked about the data uh, cloud basics, the cost efficiency, scalability. Uh, we started talking a bit about being able to model the business knowledge, uh, the notion of a knowledge graph, which if I understand kind of maybe originated from search engine like Google. And uh, you uh, told me about some interesting uh, developments from relational AI. My understanding is you're a big uh, advocate uh, and I guess a, a stakeholder uh, in that company. I'm curious if you would like to tell the audience more about uh, what's new there and uh, I, you know, I guess the, the opportunities uh, in front of us uh, in that domain. Yeah, so I mean, a knowledge graph is basically a database that uh, allows you to model a business, all the attributes about a business, as well as the the rules that in, in associated associated uh, a business logic that is asso associated with that data. So it's it's all connected together. It's a database that that can 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 reason about the business all up. And I'm you know I I am intrigued by it because uh, I, I I see the limitations. While I think the modern data stack has, has unleashed a tremendous amount of power for people to work with vast amounts of data like they never could before, there are still quite a few limitations into how you work with that information. In particular, we, we live in a hybrid world where um, even though these things are getting consolidated into, into single systems, you know, to solve a problem, you are writing SQL code and then you're writing some kind of procedural code like Python or Java or something to put your business logic. And so things are separated in that sense. The code tends to get scattered, scattered in a lot of ways. And more importantly, there's no real central place that can where you can define all of the rules of the business in a way that business people can understand. And that's and knowledge graphs can change all of that. They can they will provide they can provide a repository of the business information and the structure of the business uh, and, and the processes of the business. You can actually encode the processes of the business into the database. And I think that's gonna be a giant step forward. We just never had the capabilities before to do that. And what's enabled it and made this possible is 
uh, essentially a whole new generation of relational algorithms um, that go back to first principles from COD, you know, going back into the 1970s, thinking about the fact that there's a relational calculus and there's a relational algebra and there, those two are equivalent. The relational calculus is declarative, it is unordered. Uh, the algebra is an ordered set of, of, of statements. Um, but those two are always lot, are, are always absolutely equivalent. And, and being, by being able to do that and be able to come up with a new generation of algorithms that can work with a large number of relations, um, we can solve a bunch of a set of problems we never could solve and essentially build model driven systems where the, the, the model is the program. And, and that's only possible if the modeling environment has the semantics to be able to support that. And because of the, 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 the mathematical, the, the proofs associated with relational mathematics, uh, we know we can solve it with it, that that is, is complete in the sense that it, it, it does everything you need to do within, this, within its domain to solve the problem at hand. And so you can actually express anything you need. So it's very powerful, um, but it's, uh, it, it's, 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 it's new and it's, it, it's still in the early days. Yeah, so that sounds like a really interesting domain with deep theory behind it, tracing all the way back to uh, Ted Card and, and others. Uh, is there a more concrete example you could share that kind of help connect uh, the audience, connect the dots regarding that type of business problem uh, that this new kind of theoretical framework. Sure. Uh, I mean, I, I think governance is one of the ones where it's really very helpful, actually. Uh, you know, the, the, you, you can't easily solve a set of problems that, that, that exist in, in a number of different domains, including governance, including data governance, um, with today's modern data stack and SQL technology. Um, in particular, if the problem takes on the form of a graph-oriented problem, where there are a large number of relations that need to be connected together, SQL breaks down. And that's true for all SQL databases because all of today's modern SQL databases, Redshift, Snowflake, BigQuery, the whole bunch, Synapse, all of them, um, Oracle, they're all based on, on, on mathematical algorithms that go back 40 years that use binary join principles you know, if you think about it, you have, have, have a primary key and a foreign key, you join two tables together, you have a result set, you do another one, you join those together, you have a result set, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the query plan that gets created. Um, uh, so there's some limitations associated with that. You know, with some of these new things, you can you, they can be bypassed and you do multi-way joins and, and do all these things at once. And so the kind of problems you can solve are, are that with this are um, a simple question, what data does a person have access to? I mean, that's a question that I think today is very hard for most organizations to answer. Um, and the, you know, part of the reason why that's true is, is, that, is, that, is that a person can be a member of multiple groups so they can take on multiple roles. And how do you know what, you know, you have to, you have to parse that, you have to traverse that hierarchy and create a query that is able to, to express all of those relations and today, that's really not 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 possible to do in 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 today's systems. I see. So it sounds like with this new knowledge based system, it's going to feature a new um, data model with a new query language. Then does that mean that users would have to learn a new language and or adopt tools like the new version of Tableau or Sigma? Then speak these languages other than SQL. Yeah, I mean, SQL, I think it remains important, but SQL is insufficient to express mm -hmm. these things. So yes, there is yeah. a new language okay. and, and people will, yeah. will begin to use those. And I think what they'll do is they'll use them together with the languages they use today. So it's not like you're just going to replace everything overhand. These yeah. things will be, will, will be introduced in a way that they work with the existing tools. That's a very, very important thing. Yeah. Um, the idea, the ideal thing would be that you could use a relational knowledge graph to solve problems, mm -hmm. you know, from your Snowflake console um, and from your Snowflake environment and work in a, in, a, in a connected way, which which would be ideal. I mean, that's the idea is to make it as integrated as possible. Yeah. 
this is very ambitious. Reminds me of uh, when I was a grad student in databases, writing papers uh, myself, other people tend to invent these uh, re you know, new query languages. These are uh, one uh, example of innovating, but it's an entirely different story in productizing it and advocating for it. Uh, I wanted to connect the dots earlier, Bob, you mentioned for a new startup, a new product, how to figure out the insertion point into modern data stack uh, is important. In this case, for such foundational changes, it seems it's gonna disrupt everything. It's not gonna plug into existing BI ecosystem that speaks SQL. So if you are to run a company like this, I'm curious, how would you go and bootstrap? Well, company? I mean, you made a statement there. I don't know that's true. I mean, I actually think it, it needs to support SQL and it needs to plug into Tableau and Power BI actually, to be honest, to be straight. So I think there needs to be compatibility. That's not to say okay. that the mm -hmm. full richness of the, of the, the knowledge graph can be accessed by a tableau through sql that probably isn't true but you certainly should be able to do things that way and that's the whole point i mean one of the things that i think is 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 important and i learned this you know in my early days at microsoft which is that when you want to bring in something new to supplant or augment something else you yeah. need to do it in a way that works with the existing environment you can't just say all that stuff that you've been doing for all these years stop doing it Okay. And we're going to do something yeah. all new and different, and it's going to be so much better when you get over here. Yeah. You instead yeah. have to introduce it in a way where it, it augments and, and aids what you're yeah. doing, and then you can take on more and more over time. Right, uh, right. Yeah. Uh, a kind of uh, transition path uh, would seem important for success. I heard some rule of thumb with bootstrapping a new product. The product needs to demonstrate 10x better value by a certain dimension. For example, Snowflake is 10x better than on-prem by various dimensions like ROI, scalability, and so on. In this case, given the disruptive technology and how people may have to adopt it differently, um, how would you ramp up and demonstrate that 10x value? Like a lot well, I mean, of the simple reality is if you don't need one of these products to solve the problem, you shouldn't use it. Today. Okay. Yeah. I mean, yeah. if you if you if 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 you're happy writing Python mm -hmm. and SQL, keep writing it. I mean, that's what mm -hmm. I would say, I would say to you. If yeah. if, the, if that's solving your problems, but there are quite a few problems mm -hmm. that customers are experiencing that they can't solve. Mm -hmm. Many of them have are graph oriented problems. That's a class a full a full cat a set of examples where customers look at today's SQL databases and they go, I can't use those to solve these problems. And then they look at today's graph-oriented database, the navigational databases that exist, and they go, well, I can use them, but there are some drawbacks and they may not really be the best, they may not be a, ideal for the solution that I'm trying to do, particularly if it's an analytic problem. Um, you know, these navigate, you know, the existing databases that exist in the graph world are navigational, like, you know, like databases that existed, the codicil databases that existed in the old days before relational took over. And you know, my view is is that relational will replace, will will be the way you solve graph problems, um, and that you know, and that is the foundation for a knowledge graph. Okay, so so once you graph is is part of a knowledge graph in a sense, um, and but a knowledge graph takes that further than just a graph database because you can you can actually encode the business logic in as well. So that seems like an exciting area, Bob. Beyond this, and we talked about other aspects of modern data stack, where do you see are there other exciting problems that people are facing uh, that might become uh, maybe a bigger uh, subject uh, in the coming five, 10 years? I mean, it's one of the most exciting times really in, ter in terms of change in the industry that I can remember. Because you know, the, the view I sort of have here is that is that while most customers are still migrating to the modern data stack in some senses, they you know, some have completed their migration, but many haven't even started really. I mean, there are many customers that are just in the early stages of this. And so we're in the journey right now of, of people moving to the modern data stack. And when they do that, you know, and many customers, many, many customers have done this successfully, they now can work with data at any scale across their organizations. First time that's true. It was never true before. I mean, before you, you know, the closest you could come was if you spent a lot of money on Teradata, you could come closer to that, but you still couldn't really achieve it. And now you can, so you can have access to any of the data you want. Now, the thing that's interesting is, is that is that how people work with that. I talked about using knowledge graphs and 
coding more knowledge into the business. I mean, the other thing that that people are doing, and they're doing this everywhere, is 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 using using that data to to uh, run machine learning systems to augment their business. And you know, we're now seeing an emergence of 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 some of these large language models and foundation models that have been trained on the internet scale of data that are essentially encapsulating expertise, you know, human expertise into these, these systems. So it's a time of great transition. Um, and when you combine domain specific data that every organization has and can capture within their modern data stack, together with, with some of the pre-trained knowledge of these foundation models, I think we'll see just about every application category be completely reinvented over the next five to 10 years. You know, the fact that you have this, this vast amount of data readily accessible, and now you have these new generations of, of, of models, some of which have been trained on internet scale, um, it just creates new, uh, new opportunities we never had before. Indeed, I too am excited about the potentials of the new large uh, language models. When I was working at Google, I remember the researchers from the brain team um, was excited about coming up with transformer and later subsequently larger and larger models. Then later learned about from OpenAI, from GPT-3, and most recently read from um, some experiment from a company to, uh, which I shall not name here, but. I think uh, one challenge people are now facing is to solve the hallucination problem. So tap into the internet of expertise knowledge, but make sure they don't hallucinate. Well, I, I mean, look, <laughs> the stuff is still early. The stuff is still yeah. early. It, 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 will, it, will, it will go through a great deal mm -hmm. of um, continued refinement. You know, yeah. but we're seeing things like, like you know, with Copilot, you Copilot. know, which, which, yeah. which Microsoft and GitHub have introduced, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. they're finding that 40% of the code you know, if, if if the user is using Codepilot, forty percent of the code that they're they're checking into GitHub is written by Codepilot, which is remarkable. Remarkable, absolutely remarkable. Um, you know, it's, sure, it's probably the more templated boilerplate code, but it's still providing a, tr a, a a productivity boost that's almost unheard of for developers. Indeed, indeed. And speaking of modern data stack. There are new innovations now on a yearly or even quarterly basis. There's really been a true explosion of new products over the last couple of years, especially you know thanks to the the hot venture money. Now it's cooling down a bit. But one question is you know modern data stack complexity. Um, I talked to some CIOs who kind of reminisce with the good old past twenty years ago. Uh, to set up a database, uh, you know, they need three products, the database itself, an ETL tool, and a BI tool. That's it. And now you have data observability, catalog, lineage. Of course, Blue Sky didn't. <laughs> it's one of the players there as well. Uh, what are your thoughts, Bob, regarding the complexity? You know, inc optionality can be good, but choice fatigue might also be a thing. Um, they were well, first, of first thing right. is it was never as easy as your friend remembers. It wasn't? Okay. It's a bad server. You to buy the server, you to figure out where you know had figure where he's going to host. The, so there's all that kind of complexity associated to it. The two in the old yeah. days. So it's maybe not as easy as, as he or she remembers. Mm -hmm. But but I think that you know we're seeing. Look, I think there's five major platforms in in the modern data stack: uh, Snowflake and Databricks, Microsoft, Google, and AWS. Those are your five major platforms. Mm -hmm. Each one of them is building a relatively complete stack. They all have their own personalities. They all they take on their you know Snowflake of course is a data warehouse first and foremost, and they've augmented that with 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 the ability to write code. You know most recently by announcing support for Python. Um, Databricks is the opposite. It's a code writing platform that has added data warehouse, so they come at things from a different direction. You know Google has their way of doing things that is different. Um, uh, and then you know Microsoft and and and, and AWS they they both have their products. AWS has got you know a bazillion products that you sort of stitch together. And in the case of Microsoft, Synapse is you know Synapse is a product that is still is still evolving and and is is I think going to be quite a good product as 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 it continues to evolve. So I think we're going to see uh, you know different answers for people, and some of these solutions will get built into these platforms. You know, probably companies like Microsoft will do a pretty good job from top to bottom to of providing a set of capabilities for at least the majority of their users, not all of them, but the majority of their users. Then probably will be less true for a company like Snowflake 
where you know they are they will work more cooperatively with a lot of companies in the ecosystem and frankly don't have the resources to you know build a purview like 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 Microsoft is building you know which is their their management product that they're building for the for the Synapse data data stack. Yeah, thank you for the ecosystem analysis. So let's say we're in year 2032. So 10 years from now, where do you think the five players will look like uh, if you have a bold prediction? Well, I think, I, I mean, I'd say there still will be those five, five players. Let's just start yeah. with saying that. Will those five players yeah. still be around? Well, I think it's pretty clear the three cloud vendors will still be around. Those three will <laughs> still be around. So the question is Snowflake and Databricks, do those, are those two still around? And, and I'll just make the prediction that they will be. And the, you know, their products will all be much more mature than they are today. Um, you know, you know the, the, these are all going to be big businesses. The business sizes will continue to grow. Um, uh, the, the, the big thing I think that will have changed in that, in that time frame is I do think we'll see these knowledge graphs um, as being a major part of what people work with. I think we'll have, have seen machine learning and what we think of today as large language or foundation models having matured considerably. And I think we'll begin to be focusing on more of the attributes of what it takes to do artificial intelligence. You know, if you think about the goals of generalized artificial intelligence, you can't get there through just machine learning. Machine learning is a part of that problem, but it's not going to be it's not going to be sufficient. Uh, the more is required, reasoning is required, planning is required. There are other things that are needed, and how we do that is still to be determined. Um, and how those things emerge. But I think you know, we will have much smarter systems that emerge over the next 10 years because the found foundational infrastructure upon which it's built will have matured. We're still in a world where every one of the companies that's building the modern data stack is still maturing their platform. Um, like I say, Snowflake just announced Python support a week or two ago. Um, you know, it, uh, Databricks is still relatively new on their warehouse. Snowflake, uh, excuse me, Microsoft has you know, major updates to Synapse coming. There's a lot of things that are still coming um, that have not yet hit the market or have recently hit the market. Indeed. We're really excited about how early this, uh, you know, the, the state of the world is, and there's so much more to be done. With okay. that, uh, we're at time. Thank you so much, Bob, for your time and all of your insights. Great. It was good to talk to you. Thanks a lot.